for coming along. Um, special welcome to all of you, but also to our colleagues from the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague, who are here on a, a kind of visit. Um, they're one of our close partners in um, non-UK Europe, and we've been working together on a number of areas of collaboration and shared learning. Um, and so we have several colleagues here today, and I'll have a chance to meet with you in a little while. But in the meantime, and partly to coincide with, with this visit, um, I'm very, very pleased that um, we've got a seminar today uh, which comes from the, the side of our work at IDS that really deals with the impact of research and knowledge on real change. And not very long ago, I mean, just before the summer break, we launched in London and externally um, a new issue of the IDS Bulletin um, around how research policy partnerships in development could actually help to forward genuine impact. And today's seminar is both another kind of internal IDS launch of this bulletin, um, which was incredibly well received in London, actually, and at a meeting including a number of donors and, and people from DFID and, and those from other research and policy organisations. Um, but now's a chance for you to discuss, uh, to hear about and to discuss what's, what's in it. And this is to be given by James Georgilakis, who I think most of you in this room know, new students might not necessarily, who is our Director of Communications and Impact here at IDS and also directs the Impact Initiative, um, which, as I think he'll probably explain in a moment, um, is a major partnership with the University of Cambridge around thinking about the impact of research that's been done by a couple of DFID ESRC programs. So, um, James, over to you. I've heard a lot of this before, so I'm actually going to have to slip out and leave you to kind of both present and, and run the discussion. But um, enjoy, because there's fantastic stuff in this bulletin. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Melissa. <coughs> Thanks very much. Um, well, welcome, everyone. So, um, yeah, this is, as, as Melissa's explained, I'm here mainly to talk about, about this bulletin, um, <coughs> and particularly um, the bulletin in its introductory chapter has provided some suggestions around the potential framework one can use to think about how to construct partnerships that are between researchers and non-researchers, effectively, or how to give your partnership a bit of a health check. Um, so the, the bulletin itself was always intended to be of quite a lot of practical, uh, have a practical application for practitioners and program managers, but we wanted to make sure it was underpinned by strong case studies and, and, and uh, uh, the relevant literature. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, why we thought this was an important subject, why we think it's relevant, um, and where it sort of came from, and then I'm going to give you a sense of uh, a quick quick introduction to some of the literature, some of the ideas that this idea of partnership between academics and non-academics is based upon, uh, and then introduce you to the framework. And I, I don't think that's going to take me 45 minutes or anything like that. So, um, <clears throat> you know, there'll be plenty of time for, for some questions or some just discussion, given the size of the group, you know, and it's only me. If you haven't got a panel, you might just want to want to talk to one another about some of these concepts or ask me some questions. Um, Important to say, and I realised <clears throat> too late as I rushed here that I hadn't put it on the sl first slide, uh, I co-edited the bulletin with uh, Pauline Rose who, from Cambridge University. And in every way, in, in terms of the way we built this publication, because it was about partnership between researchers and non-researchers, we insisted when we commissioned the articles that every paper had to be co-written by the partners or by representatives from that partnership and it was also edited by if you like a traditional academic at Cambridge and a practitioner me because my role here is I lead uh, IDS's communications and impact work so you know the whole the whole thing was constructed and or co-constructed by by these partners who have different perspectives because that's really what it's about so um in terms of, of where it sort of came from, so uh, as, as Melissa mentioned, um, there's a big programme here at IDS uh, that we run with Cambridge called the Impact Initiative. And what we've been doing since 2015 is we were contracted by DFID and by ESRC to support a wide range of, re of research projects that they had funded, going right back to 2005, they had this big portfolio of research that they'd funded. 
some of which uh, had now finished and some of which were, hadn't even been commissioned yet and they thought, well, we're feeling a bit underwhelmed by the amount of impact this research has had and they're quite small projects, so rather than give them bits, bits of money to do more, why don't we create a knowledge brokering function that would work with the whole portfolio and seek out opportunities to, for them to have more impact than they might otherwise have had, ha, have had beyond academia. So this is our, I had to dig this out because I'd sort of forgotten what we originally said we were going to do. This is what we originally said we were going to do. We were going to leverage awareness of the programmes, these two programmes of research, that, which are known as the Joint Fund for Poverty Alleviation and the Raising Learning Outcomes in Education programme. And we're going to um, we're going to work with them in order to exploit all kinds of opportunities to engage policy actors and practitioners with the research that they were doing or have done. Um, and in delivering the impact initiative, which has been a, a, a fascinating uh, project to work on, we got to know these programmes of research very well. So just to give it the, some context, because this is where the contributions to this journal have, uh, this issue of the bulletin have come from. Um, you've got the Raising Learning Outcomes in Education Systems program. It's, uh, it, it came into being around two th uh, middle of 2014, I think. Um, their, their grants of no more than a million pounds. Um, I think to date there are about 45 grants and they're in their final phase now, but it won't wrap up until 2021. Um, and they're looking at a whole range of different themes within education. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that. It's quite broad. Um, and then the bigger programme was the Joint Fund for Poverty Alleviation Research, which, you know, people here at IDS were grant holders. You know, there were a number of examples of grants that IDS was awarded from this, from this fund. It goes right back to 2005, and it was very much framed by the MDGs. Um, and it was very broad, so you could do research under almost any topic within this, within this programme. Not particularly large grants, um, and the focus did change over time. Um, and it will finally wrap up, um, well, it officially wraps up at the end of this year. So no more uh, grants will be awarded now. The final phase is known as Development Frontiers. So we've worked with over, by the time we finish as a programme, we will have worked with over 200 separate projects in 72 different countries that the only thing they really share in common is that they were funded through the same mechanism. And our job was to increase their impact. Um, and so... This isn't a presentation about the impact initiative, but just to explain, so what we did was we thought about how rather than just going, going to individual projects or waiting for them to come to us, which they didn't really do anyway, uh, and see what we could do, which is maybe the kind of work you might find an, an embedded communications person might do in a university or in a project, we actually assessed the portfolio as a whole and we try to identify where projects grouped around particular themes or policy issues. And in every case, that wasn't how they were originally commissioned, but we found patterns, patterns by geography and thematic area, or even just patterns by the intended audience for the research. Obviously also patterns in methodology. Arguably, we're a bit less focused on that. Lots of learning there, but our focus, our remit was very clearly on engaging beyond academia. And then we looked at ways to build those groupings, uh, you know, bring them together, build networks, ask them what they thought we could do to help, uh, and generally uh, then begin to in, uh, do some synthesis and some engagement with them. Um, and perhaps not surprised, and if you're interested in the programme, there's a URL there, or you can just Google the Impact Initiative. Uh, there's a website with all of the stuff we've done, and it's a really nice resource, and we are gonna, we've just been awarded a sixth year. It was meant to originally be a four-year pro programme, um, and in the end, it's, it's been extended, so we'll, we've, we're going to be in operation for a while longer. But what we learned in doing this work is by far the most important issue that const continually resonated um, with, with our, between ourselves as a team delivering the programme and with the grant holders was, was, was partnership. Partnership, partnership, partnership. Partnership, stupid. So uh, this was the persistent message that would emerge, that the, the value added we could bring was around either identifying existing partnerships that we could support or building new partnerships or collaborations. And I'll, I'll come to the, what I mean by partnership in a minute. 
So this was the, this was the really interesting part of the program. And, in, and in, back in 2017, we, <clears throat> as part of our program, we, and with a little bit of funding from IDS, we produced a publication called The Social Realities of Knowledge for Development, which if you just Google that, you will find it. It's available free to download online. And it was a collection of case studies that included a couple from the ESRC DFID portfolio that we supported that looked at how people were trying to engage academic research with policy and what some of the challenges had been around that. And what, emer what emerged from that, because we didn't have the title when we started, but what emerged from that was this, was this very strong perception that the uptake of research evidence or engagement with research evidence is a, is a social process. It's a process of people becoming connected to one another. It's a relational process, which for me was quite was actually quite surprising. So it might sound obvious to some of you, but I've worked for 20 years as a communications practitioner telling people, if we could just get you to write better policy briefs, if we could just get you to speak more clearly and in plain English about your research, or when I work with NGOs, if we can just use the research and utilise it more effectively in our communications campaigns, wonderful things will happen. And what we were getting from this, uh, this publication was a sense that Okay, technical, the te your technical capacity to translate research for policies, yeah, of course it's important, but it's not nearly as important as the networks and the relationships and the, so and the, and the, and the, 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 the social and relational stuff. So that kind of planted an idea in our minds. Well, well if we're interested in that aspect of, of, of how you engage evidence with policy and practice, um, could we think a bit more about this concept of partnership? Because partnership is a much overused word in development. Um, and it's probably often used quite, um, it's a bit of a buzzword. And we began to think about what if we could look at a range of different research projects and their own experiences of working in this way, and we could look at the relevant literature, what if we could try and come up with a framework for what a really successful partnership between researchers and non-researchers might look like it on, on the basis they're trying to achieve some kind of impact beyond academia. So the kind of this idea was kind of niggling away at us and so then we decided to actually um, take that forward uh, in the form of uh, this IDS bulletin where we basically put out a call to the grant holders to see who would like to potentially submit some, uh, an abstract. And we also approached a few proactively who we felt had a particularly interesting story to tell. Now, before you get into the what makes a great partnership between researchers and non-researchers, you, you have to unpick a little bit this concept of impact. And this could be a presentation in itself. But I just feel I have to explain where we were coming from in order for the rest of, the, rest of this to make some sense. So as a programme, we'd clearly had to give the donor, the funders, a very clear indication from the very start during our inception phase what we thought they meant by impact beyond academia. Um, and we came up with this thing called the Wheel of Impact, which sounds like a terrible game show. But... Um, uh, and, and we were quite strategic in a way. We wanted to come up with something which we were comfortable with, conceptually, but we knew also they could understand. And so the dark blue areas are essentially uh, borrowed straight out of the ESRC's own impact toolkit. If you look at the ESRC's website, uh, or UKRI's website for that matter, you will see that uh, these are the areas that they uh, talk about when they think about impact of research. Uh, and then we added a fourth. So I'm just going to whiz through this. DFID now use this. The DFID education team now use this actual slide when they talk about impact. So we kind of nicked it from them and then they took it back from us, which is quite interesting. So uh, some of you are going to be very familiar with these concepts, but just quickly. Uh, so top left, conceptual impact. This is the idea, well established in the literature, um, that you know by producing and communicating and publishing research, uh, you can, and engaging with others during the research process, you may be able to influence their way of thinking, their ideas, their awareness, and so on. So it's the classic idea of academia that, you know, you're trying to contribute new knowledge. 
Um, and there's lots of different ideas about how that might happen, which I'm not going to go into in detail now. Uh, but, but, you know, it might take a long time. You might have a perception this is a long-term a long process, or you might think it's something you could do in the shorter term with a particular group or audience. But it's a conceptual impact. On the top right, you've got instrumental. This is, what, this is the impact DFID loves. Right? This is the impact that donors, a lot of donors love. The idea that we produce research knowledge and it will somehow uh, directly inform policy decision making. Uh, it, it can directly be, you can dire directly attribute to research or new knowledge some change in direction in policy or practice. Instrumental impact. Bottom, down the bottom, capacity, but capacity building impacts, not really language that IDS tends to use anymore, the kind of capacity building stuff, but at the time, this is what was still very much in favour with the research councils, the idea that through the research process, you may be seeking to build the capacity of researchers themselves or of communities to hold their, their governments to account or of policy makers to be able to make better use of research. So there's a kind of, there's a capacity building outcome. So this is the impact of the research process itself, building capacity. And then we added this fourth area because we could tell right from the start that as a programme, we were going to be so focused on building networks and relationships, we were quite keen that that type of change would be, um, would be measured as part of the impact we were having. And so we, some people might collapse this networks and connectivity into capacity building, but we didn't want to do that. Instead, we kind of pulled it out as a separate mode of impact, as ESRC call it, and changes in relationships, changes in how evidence, uh, how the supply of evidence can be linked up with the demand for it. Will, could, can lead to longer-term changes in behaviour and longer-term evidence use, which you can't attribute to that particular research project or programme, but you can measure changes in connectivity and networks and relationships. So those are our definitions of impact, and if you have violent uh, uh, disagreements with this, we can talk about it at the end. But that's the basis on which we were thinking about research partnerships. What would a good research partnership look like? with non-researchers that was focused on achievement of change of one of these four types. Um, so then we did, before we kind of got into the case studies themselves, and there's a number of really interesting case studies in here uh, written by various different research teams uh, that we worked with, we then looked at the literature on, on partnerships and impact. Um, and it kind of led us towards kind of three different areas of literature. Uh, uh, and first of all, it's worth just mentioning how, how these concepts have evolved over the last 40 years or so. So if you go back to, uh, do you go back some time, some decades, you will find that the, main, main, the mostly the discussion around the impact of social science was very driven by concepts that came from the natural sciences. So the idea is, you know, someone is generating research and knowledge, and that research and knowledge, if relevant to real world kind of problems, and if made uh, accessible to people who are dealing with those problems, will inform policy and action. Right? Um, and you know, if you have a gap, and this is where you come back to this idea of technical versus social and relational and political, if you have a gap between the sort of the evidence that's being produced and the use of evidence, you'll probably be able to overcome that gap by making sure you're telling the right people about the research and you're communicating it in a way they can understand. Um, a, a slightly different view of that is that, yes, research may be utilised when it responds to a, a policy problem, but here it's the policy, the policy environment and the political environment that are kind of shaping uh, what people think the problem is and therefore it, it, it's, more, it's less of a push from the researcher out to the research user, and it's more of a pull from the policy actor or the, uh, the political actor uh, f uh, on, on, the, on the researchers themselves. And the, 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 the assumption here is that everyone's going to be more or less in agreement about what the problem is. Right? So the, the more cynical view of this, uh, number two, is this isn't, um, you've probably heard the phrase, evidence-based policy, uh, uh, so, so this is, is um, uh, you know, policy-based evidence. So it's the tail rather wagging the dog is another way of looking at it. 
But it's still linear. It's still linear, right? It's still assuming that there is a group of people who produce research and a group of people that use research, and there's this fairly linear causality between them. Um, where I give any references here, um, if you actually look at the bulletin online and you go to the introductory chapter, the actual um, uh, the, the, the references are all listed. So lots of different ideas around this emerged. And there's a very famous paper that everybody cites. I think it's because it's only three pages long, and that's why everyone cites it. But Carol Weiss, 1979. It's the paper everyone has to read if you're interested in this stuff. And she sets out all the various different models, concepts of evidence use. And her own favoured version of this was still fairly linear, but she said it takes a really long time, and ideas will gradually percolate down into society and down into politics over a very long period of time. Um, sort of this percolation of knowledge from many different sources of research, not just one research report. Now, more recently, um, there has been lots written about the fact that this linearity is nonsense and that societies and the relationship between society and research is much more complicated than that. Um, and there's a big literature on this. And essentially, though, what everyone kind of agrees around, and this is number three, that there's no such thing as a policy cycle. So when I, back in the noughties, when I was going training NGOs about how to influence policy with evidence-based, uh, ev you know, kind of have an evidence-based approach to advocacy, we used to have this thing that said, this is the policy cycle, and you've got to work out, are you, in, are you engaging with that po moment when they're formulating the policy? Are you engaging with the moment when they're implementing the policy, and so on? And people like uh, Nutley came along and said, well, there isn't really any such thing as a policy cycle. It's more messy than that. Everything's happening all at once. And all the actors are engaging with each other all of the time. And it's not even clear who's, who's in which role. So the, kind of the, 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 the relationship between the producers of research and the consumers of research is actually quite blurred. Um, and it's a highly interactive and messy process. Now, people don't really like this because we don't really know what to do about it. So DFID don't like this, for example. Research donors find this very challenging. And so even though the literature is very strong on it being a very interactive process, what you find in research kind of bids and the way often donors shape research, uh, the design of research programs, is something more like number four, where you're back to this idea that whilst it might be quite complicated, ultimately there is a gap. This should be called Mind of the Gap, this one. There is a gap between the research uh, and what researchers want to do and want to look at and how they do it and the, the, the problems faced by policymakers. Um, and you need to bridge this gap with better communications, perhaps better networks, but it's a, it's a gap that needs to be bridged. It's still, in a sense, quite linear. Okay. Um, and what you get from this body of literature is a real sense that it's the interactive model, you know, and put in, plus the work we'd already done on this, when you actually look at the case study material and people's experiences, the interactive, interactive model is very attractive. Um, and uh, the interactive model is built on this, these concepts of social, relational, um, political and social norms shaping not just evidence use, but evidence production. So we then looked for literature that was around um, this idea of mutu mutuality. So partnerships, surely, are about different partners having something in common, and that's why they want to work together. What we found when we looked at partnership is that it's actually very difficult because there's many different definitions of partnership. It's not actually a very helpful word. There's probably a better word. You might have an idea what the better word is. It's often used very, I mean, very kind of symbolically. It's a buzzword, um, particularly in development. Um, and you know, if, if you do a literature, <laughs> you do a literature search using partnership and development, you spend a long time sifting through a lot of stuff that isn't actually about partnerships and development at all. Um, but what you come back to, again, and, and, and what's in, in, in development literature, there's a big focus on the north and the south dynamic, all right? And, 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 the, and the, 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 the difficulties of collaborations or partnerships, whatever you want to call them, between the northern donors, if you like, 
and the recipients in the South, whether they be governments or NGOs or whatever. But we wanted to look beyond that literature because we were trying to understand a bit more about the particular dynamics between partnerships between researchers and non-researchers. And that could include a partnership that entirely takes place in a global, in a southern context. What's absolutely clear, though, from whatever you read, is that there is, um, you know, a very strong sense that in any partnership, there's no such thing as a mutual partnership or an equal partnership. In all partnerships, there is going to be some level of power inequality, and particularly in relation when, to, to how knowledge is generated and used. And Henning, um, Henning Melbourne is a really good source on this, that this idea you can't look at uh, any dynamic where knowledge is being generated and then deployed in some way without encountering um, power inequalities uh, and, or power asymmetries. So uh, this idea of mutuality, though, I mean, there are some frameworks to try to deal with mutuality. Um, and you know, Brinkerhoff talks about mutual interdependence. So mutuality doesn't mean you're equal, but it means you're mutually interdependent on one another. In order to achieve your goals, you work together. So there's enough of a benefit uh, for each party to come together and mutually commit to something because by working with one another, they're more likely to achieve uh, their, their mission. Um, if you do look at the literature on partnerships and development at the moment, you're going to straight away come across this excellent movement towards equitable research partnerships, which has been gathering momentum over the last few years. Um, and in fact, we felt it was such an important aspect of this that one of, the, uh, one of the chapters in here that doesn't relate to an ESRC DFID project, so strictly speaking, it wasn't part of our original brief, but we included a chapter in here by uh, Kate Newman and Jude, Fran Jude Franz Franzman and their partners, who've been doing this fantastic work around equitable research partnerships, which very much overlaps with what we're interested in, but it is only arguably one particular aspect of it. And they've come up with these kind of eight principles to equitable partnerships. Um, and, and they're very interested in these huge challenges around, well, I'll give you an example. ESSE DFID grants, almost every PI, uh, principal investigator, is based in a northern institution, right? The money gen it comes from the north and it's dished out to partners in the south. Um, and often research partners in the south feel like they're being used just to collect data. So they deal, they, they have, they've done some very interesting work on this and it's a really important movement and it's very much linked to the decolonisation and development debate as well. Um, however, and this is the bit where I slightly deviate maybe from the more, the more normal IDS position, when we looked at this closely, thinking about impact on policy and practice, it was hard to ignore the fact that equitable partnerships are not, are not necessarily a prerequisite for impact. I mean, you can have, um, so we can all agree that equitable partnership is a moral imperative and desirable uh, and is an important part of social justice and particularly for participatory action researchers, particularly here at IDS, you know, this is about cognitive justice. It's the, it's the moral and ethical imperative um, to build partnerships which are respectful and equal, right? But if you're looking at impact, we could clearly see from the case studies that we were reviewing and from the wider literature that sometimes engaging with policy, uh, it almost never involves equal partners. Um, and it, it often involves tensions and trade-offs and compromises um, in order to push forward progressive social change, which is kind of problematic. And we had quite a big debate about this, as you can imagine, with uh, Jude Franzman and Kate Newman, who were doing the work on equitable partnerships. Saying that, uh, we're not, it, th th there's no suggestion here that you should join into any kind of collaboration to achieve your aims, uh, regardless of the power, uh, uh, the, the power situation. And I mean, I'm conscious Robert sat here. So, you know, you go into these, and he would have a lot to say about this, you go into these partnerships uh, with a, a, what, what Swilling calls reflexive caution. You know, the game is fixed to some extent. If you're a researcher who suddenly finds your research is found to be incredibly relevant by a particular set of policy actors, and they invite you in, you know, to because they want to take uh, advantage of your advice. And you think, well, this is great. You know, they, there's strong demand for my research. 
and you know they're off, they're, this feels like a partnership, a really good collaboration where I can have an impact. The thing you have to bear in mind is those policy actors are, um, they've already decided what the problem is, probably, and they've already decided for whatever reason that your research is going to provide them with the answer. And that's a very dangerous situation to be in. And there's this lovely, um, uh, there's this lovely phrase um, but from, from Hager, dr dramaturgy, the stage is set. The stage is set by the people in the room with all the power. So lots and lots of risk in partnerships. Uh, in terms of trying to ensure, if, you're, if what you're trying to do through your research is to uh, perhaps you know, improve policy processes, uh, there's, a re there's obviously some real risks around entering into those sorts of partnerships. doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but you need to go into these relationships with your eyes open. Um, the other thing that we struggled with a little bit, because it was slightly uncharted territory for me at least, having been at IDS for quite a few years, is we couldn't find much evidence of the co-production of research being always a prerequisite for a good research partnership. Um, so if you're looking at traditions, in, again, in more participatory action research kind of traditions, then clearly it's all about co-production. But co-production is, you know, co-production and good and equitable partnerships are in, often viewed as an end in themselves. You know, there's a moral imperative there again. Um, and this, this is partnerships as, as, a, as a democratic tool to promote inclusivity and equity and so on. Very important. But we also looked at case studies where the research methodology um, that was um, being deployed didn't necessarily uh, involve a huge amount of co-production, and actually the partners had quite re clear roles within the partnership. Uh, the example that we were given, the, the example I, I might mention is um, uh, from from the chapter. Um, uh, the, the, there's a chapter by. Um, uh, oh God, I've had a brain. I've had a brain freeze. You see, this is what's been coming from long management meeting before you give a seminar. Mushtaq Chowdhury. So Mushtaq Chowdhury, who's well known at IDS, he he used to be uh, Leeds BRAC, biggest NGO in the world, and talks about this very very well known story about a long term partnership between BRAC and the government of Bangladesh and how they were trying to address extreme poverty. And all through it, he was emphasising the value of independent research. So. There's lots of different aspects to this, and it depends on what your entry point is. What was very clear is that um, what's become increasingly obvious is that people are really interested in other, other actors as well as those in, within the partnership itself. So knowledge mobilization, which is horrible jargon, but the idea of mobilizing knowledge and research has increasingly focused on the role of intermediaries or boundary partners. So these might be people who aren't really a part of your core partnership as such, um, but they play an incredibly important role. So that might be the media, it might be civil society organisations, it might be think tanks or whatever. Um, in, probably in global health is the best example of where you get lots of, lots of uh, initiatives that are trying to bring together researchers and policy makers and practitioners and that it, that's a fundamentally relational process, um, but they all have quite well-defined roles. Um, and then finally, we looked at a literature that related to partnerships um, and how they, what is it about engaging in policy in particular? So I've been kind of banding about policy and practice. In truth, I would say most of the publications, case studies, are more focused on policy rather than practice. And we wanted to look at um, policy theory literature as well to try and unpick this a little bit. And that's where you come across quite a strong criticism of this partnerships, this positive, equitable partnerships kind of theory and development. If you look at um, NGOs, so, for example, there's a very interesting paper written by uh, Ruth Main at Oxfam. Uh, they'll say, well, look, it's all very nice when, when researchers have these cosy connections with policymakers and policy actors and intermediaries of various kinds, but these strong relationships and individual connections are not on their own adequate to really bring about any significant change. Um, and you... 
you see this, in, uh, you, you, they talk a lot about the need to look beyond just the strength of a set of relationships and a, you know, a common or overlapping agenda and think about what happens when you need to actually come to frame your research for a policy agenda and how difficult that is. Um, I, haven't got, I haven't got it on the slide, but this is slight, slightly reminded me of um, Kingdom's theory on, on policy streams. So this idea that, and this happens a lot, I think, in development, you might be working with a series of kind of mid-level bureaucrats or civil servants in a particular government department, and they're kind of technical people, right? And you're kind of technical people, even though you talk about them as being the policy makers. Well, they're not policy makers. They don't make policy, they're not elected officials. And, and you work with them and you share some real, real common ideas around what good policy might look like, what good evidence might look like. But when that issue then finds itself, whatever it might be, it might be, it might be you know, better primary school education or it might be better access to whatever, but when that issue suddenly finds itself in the political limelight, but for whatever reason, often as a result of some kind of crisis, suddenly those relationships don't count for much because then you're dealing with decision makers who want hard and fast policy solutions framed in a way that they can understand and they will find useful. And it doesn't matter how epistemically robust your research is or how good those connections were with some of those specialists, you then still have difficulty in enge with engaging with policy. And that's what the kind of the NGOs and the advocacy people are talking about. You still need to be able to quickly respond to those policy opportunities. You need to be able to adapt and you need to have the right people in your partnership to do so. So if you haven't got connections already in your partnership with people that can help you in that situation, the partnership might ultimately fail to achieve its objectives. Um, best thing you can read, I reckon, on policy framing, this is very much my cup of tea, because uh, it's kind of about communications. Uh, George Lakoff, uh, he's written lots of academic articles, but I recommend um, his book, um, Don't Think of an Elephant. That might not be on the list. Um, which is all about, you know, why particularly those of us on the left, sorry, making a bit of an assumption there, but particularly those of us on the left re are, re are often much worse at framing uh, our issues and our evidence for policy than people on the right. He talks about why, how that's played out in the US. So, um, yeah, don't rely too much on those long-standing relationships with specialists. Think about who else you need to have in the partnership. Um, and yeah, capability to adapt for policy requires good timing, policy-relevant research, relevant for whom. I know that's a very difficult, uh, a very problematic concept. Uh, ability to contextualise research for evidence um, uh, and, and having people positioned appropriately. Um, and they, these, the, uh, what I, think what I think I would agree with the NGO type critique is those qualities don't automatically fall out of a nice partnership between people with a reasonably mutual agenda who are really good at interacting with each other throughout the lifespan of a research project. It, they, need, they require special attention. So... Um, that was, that's, that's a kind of whirlwind tour of the literature. If you're interested in it, it spans sociology and policy studies and anthropology and all sorts. Um, and if you're interested in it, check out the article. Um, so we then looked at a number of different case studies. And I'm not going to go into each case study, each chapter, because that would be very boring and there's no time for that. You probably just need to read them for yourselves. They're very diverse. There's people working on education. There's a, there's a case study from DFID itself, which was really interesting to commission. Um, there are case studies from all African research teams working with, in a very, under very difficult circumstances with the Ethiopian government. There's all kinds of things in there. And what, when we looked across them and thought about what emerged from the literature, we came up with these three con, uh, core kind of qualities of good partnerships. And these, are, these have been developed we hope people will test them and, you know, stress test them and add to them and change them. But we thought they were a good start. So we came up with the concept of bounded mutuality, which I'll talk about in a minute, sustained interactivity and policy adaptability. And we came up with this snazzy diagram um, that, that tried to explain how these relate to modes of impact. So these are your partnership qualities in the middle. And you've got your three qualities and then around here, you've got your different concepts of the impact you're seeking to achieve. Um, 
And we found ex these existed, or elements of these existed in all the case studies that we reviewed, but to varying degrees. And often what we found is people were, without necessarily using the same language, were reflecting on where they were absent as a means of explaining why they hadn't been more successful. The hardest thing about commissioning this bulletin was we said to people, we want you to write about failure. People are not keen on writing about failure, uh, especially when they know it might be read by the people who funded the research. But we were really trying to encourage them, don't just tell us it all went brilliantly and you had loads of impact. Tell us what was hard. Now, the decision to get people to write together with their partners probably didn't help. But at least we actually physically brought them to IDS at, for a workshop so they could talk these two things through face to face. Um, so there was a lot. Th this is not a list of impact stories, right? This is not a load of people saying we had loads of impact. Quite a lot of it is people saying we didn't have much impact. And this is why we think what the problems were in relation to partnerships. So we came up with these three ideas. And I'm just going to run through each one very quickly. Having said I wouldn't speak for 45 minutes, I have, so that's embarrassing. Um, Oh, yeah, the other thing is, I mean, being a research communicator, we couldn't present that to the donors, so we turned that into that. Um, because uh, we knew we, we wanted to launch this uh, in London. We did launch it in London with DFID and UKRI and ESRC, so they would feel ownership of it. Because, you know, if you're going to do a, <laughs> write a, a whole issue about research partnerships, you kind of kind of practice what you preach. So we kind of made them feel that they owned it, uh, helped a lot with the fact that Diffid were very excited that actually got to write one of the papers. Um, and then we turned it into something that, that, that they would share uh, amongst themselves. Um, so, bounded mutuality. What do I mean by bounded? Um, so this is borrowed from... Uh, a concept known as um, uh, bounded rationality, which is this idea that policymakers are, rather than just thinking policymakers are terrible people, right, which is not very helpful, although sometimes it's true, um, policymakers have a limited capacity to focus on all the different issues that cross their desk, right? They can't, you know, res a researcher might dedicate their whole career to studying one thing. Policymakers have 20 different things across their desk every day. And so that, that limits their ability to give everything reasonable consideration. But they're also limited by their own bias and their, their, their own, the, and the political context and social norms. Uh, so the, the idea is that their rationality is therefore bounded, right? So we thought, well, what we've found is there's no such thing really as an equal partnership, although it's something we always have to strive towards. And agendas aren't actually fully mutual. They just overlap. And the key point here is that different organisations and a partnership are mandated differently, right? So an NGO is mandated differently, is accountable to a different group of people and in different ways to an independent research organisation. An independent research organisation or a university is mandated differently to a government official. So your, the level that you have a truly common agenda is always going to be fixed by that. So it's, and, and by social norms and bias and organisational politics and all the other things. So bounded mutuality. And we wanted to come up with a way of talking about this as a positive thing, because rather than just sit around and bemoan the fact that it's very difficult, um, we wanted to think about how can you impact, how could, it, could we come up with something which is actually quite empowering? Because once you, once you accept that mutuality is bounded, it is actually quite empowering, because then you can focus on what can I do about it, and how can we make this partnership work to our advantage? Um, and... Th and, why, and can we be transparent about this? When you enter into a partnership or when you're building a research program at the beginning, let's sit down and really thrash this stuff out. Let's really identify what are each of us, how are each of us accountable, what are, what are our reasons for being here, what do we hope to achieve, and where is there a sweet spot for collaboration? Where is there an overlap? And often what will fall out of that is then a really good understanding of what your, each of your roles and responsibilities are. So, you know, and how you can add value to the partnership. So it's about a bit of convergence, right? Um, and, and you can see lots of examples of that. So, so I think I've already spoke, spoken quite a bit about where this idea comes from, but it's meant to be something that can empower us rather than limit, uh, limit us in terms of the partnerships that we can enter into. So the second uh, 
quality of partnerships, sustained interactivity. This isn't very revolutionary, but I think we felt it was worth emphasising it. So, and, and certainly donors don't behave as if this is important. So sustained means you know, you're trying to engage from people right from the start of the process. So this is not the kind of partnership where you'll have researchers going along, they get to the stage where they need to disseminate their results and start looking for partners to help with dissemination. There's nothing wrong with that, that can be very important, but that's not a, a, a quality partnership. Um, we, we noticed that the really successful projects had partnerships which pre-existed the project and were built, they were built on something which happened before the project even started and continued after the project ended. Um, and um, the reason for, the, the, politically, the reason sustained interactivity is so important is you don't know when those opportunities are going to come along. You don't know when there's going to be a policy window. You don't know when you're going to need to draw on those people's expertise. So it's better to have continually built up trust and continually stayed in touch with one another to iteratively develop the research where everyone feels ownership of the research than to only engage at certain points, you know, like the beginning and the middle of the end or whatever it is. Um, and we, we saw lots of examples of both formal structures uh, that obviously support interactivity, like advisory groups and whatever, but most of the projects uh, emphasised much more informal approaches uh, to engaging with one another and building trust. And then lastly, policy adaptability. Um, so this is <clears throat> really about an ability of a partnership to not be too constrained, and this is, this is hard, right? But the ability of a partnership not to be too constrained by a log frame, by a very limited set of opportunities to change course. Um, and this often comes from who's in the partnership. So it might be really hard for researchers to drop everything and go off and you know, fly off to the UN or go back to the field and engage with local policymakers, but have you got people in the partnership who could do that kind of thing? How, are you that, have you got that kind of level of adaptability? Have you got people who are comfortable with being able to reframe evidence for policy or who are just the right messengers? You know, because sometimes reframing is less about changing the language, it's more about who's, who's delivering the message. Have you got the kinds of boundary partners that will enable you to respond quickly to opportunities as they arise. Often it's your boundary partners, you know, it's that think tank or, or that journalist you know, uh, or a partner institution, or a particular, in, a particular bureaucrat in a particular government department who are actually going to be in a position to act upon a particular opportunity as it arises. Um, what, what I keep coming back to with this, I mentioned it earlier, is this really awful problem we have with research that can be incredibly rigorous and robust but still be seemingly unable to offer anything that's politically viable. But I know that sounds weird, but I, I was thinking about this a lot recently. I mean, this is essentially what's happening in climate change science, right? So your ability, which is a bit of a bigger comparison, but you know, <laughs> your ability to be able to um, engage in a way that will not have the door slammed in your face is part of policy adaptability uh, and an ability know, to know when not to engage and when the risk is too great or that the research is going to be misrepresented. Um, and this can relate to a much longer term agenda uh, around kind of more conceptual impact as well as more instrumental impact because I realise I'm making it sound like it's all about evidence directly influencing policy but this might be, this might be a much gentler and longer term process. So what do we do with this? We um, pulled it all together. We made it even simpler. We came up with three things you could do. Uh, bounded mutuality, sustainability, positive adaptability. So exploit the differences in your expertise and networks. Rather than seeing those differences as a barrier to collaboration, think about how you can exploit them. Be clear about how roles and responsibilities differ. Ensure that everyone understands the overall goal. Uh, build on pre-existing relationships as an alliance. Exchange ideas continuously, both with, partnership, with the partnership and beyond, and build trust and respect. And finally, identify policy engagement opportunities, frame evidence for policy audiences, and adapt to changing environments. And the articles in here, we found that these three, um, uh, these three qualities really resonated with the articles, as I said before, either because they were 
um, very strongly represented or because the authors were kind of bemoaning that the fact that they were lacking in these areas and they wished they had done something differently. Um, and, I mean, this can include extremely difficult relationships as well. So one of the, my favourite chapters, my personal favourite, which is not my own, uh, is, is, is from a group of Ethiopian researchers, an entirely southern team, which is a very rare thing for DFID-funded research, ESSC-funded research, who were doing research with pastoralists uh, in Ethiopia and were doing this in partnership with the Ethiopian government, which has, as you may know, gone through some pretty volatile experiences recently. And their partners in government regarded pastoralists as backward, right, and obstructive to progress. And these researchers, that's, that's the partnership, right? So that, that doesn't seem like a really good functioning partnership. But they managed to negotiate this. They talked about... There was, a, there was a place where their interests overlapped with the government. They identified what it was without feeling compromised. They did identify a way to, to keep that conversation going. They didn't just go off and a year later come back and say, here you go, just for the, for the government to go, this is absolutely outrageous, I'm going to lock you all up. And they were quite adaptive in that they were continually kind of renegotiating who they were working with and how to frame the evidence in a way that allowed them to deliver high-quality research without feeling compromised. It's a, br it's a, br it's a, brilliant, um, it's a brilliant story of, of how to put these into practice in very, very uh, challenging situations. So we went and launched this uh, with, as I said, with various partners. We were really trying to influence donors with this more than anything because it... it it does, it, you know, we said to them, we, we spent a whole day with them, and we said, okay, let's talk about how interdisciplinary research, I mean by that research that brings together researchers and policy actors and uh, practitioners. How does it maximise impact? What's important about it for impact? Um, what, we introduced them to these concepts, but we asked them, what do you think are the key ingredients? Um, how can we improve the use of evidence uh, particularly of social science in policy, because we know that's important to donors at the moment. Um, and what can you, the funders, as well as us, the researchers, uh, do and policy professionals do to make better, to support these kinds of partnerships? Um, and I would say that it was quite encouraging the response we got. Because no one, really can dis no one really disagrees with the framework. They all say, yeah, that all sounds great. The disagreement comes on well, what we're going to do about it. Um, because if you, for those of you familiar with applying for research funding, you know, a lot of what's in that framework is there are a lot of barriers to building partnerships along those principles. You, know, you don't have a chance often to have a significant inception period to build trust with your partners or even identify who the right partners will be. You're in this mad rush to write a research proposal and you're, you're scrubbing around trying to find the right people to connect with. Um, there isn't often an opportunity to interact uh, with each other on a, in a more iterative and continuous way because of the shape of the funding and the shape of the programme. And there certainly isn't an opportunity to reflect and learn together after the project ends. It just ends and the project is finished and the funding's gone. Um, the response we got from uh, Diana Dalton, who is the Deputy, is the director of, De Deputy director of the Research Evidence Division at DFID, is we said she wrote some very nice things for us. She wrote the forward to the bulletin and she wrote a nice blog and she said, oh, this is a very important issue and I completely agree and we must support it. What she said off the record was, you should have got the procurement people here. So we had really good turnout from DFID and they all kind of agreed, but she said, you need to get the procurement people here to hear this. They're the ones who are going to make this possible. They're the ones who can support that kind of approach to partnership. We can't, which was... Um, very interesting, and that's so I quite know how we achieve that because they don't often leave their fortress in East Kilbride. But um, that, that was the message. So donors can do a lot to support this, but so can researchers. Um, and um, that's it. So um, I will wrap up there, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. Thank you.